think it worked. There we go. Hi, everybody. It's Jackie with Rigor Crafts here again. And today I am on my own for this, um, at least for the first few of these. So bear with me. I'm starting just a minute or so early uh, so that I can make sure everything's up and running. Um, if it is your first time joining us for our live demonstration day, welcome. I am going to be making um, some of my jewelry pieces, showing you how it's made. Because today would have been the Manassas Viking Festival, um, which was our first event ever when they did their first one. And we love it. We love going there every year. Uh, the people that come out and support us are wonderful. So we wanted to do a live event so that we could still do our demonstrations. And there it is. All right. I am, in fact, live. I can see it on the event right now. So I am just going to make sure that I've got this shared here. And I don't see anybody in here right now. All right. So I am going to go ahead and get started. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is making a pair of these earrings here. They are my Celtic Spiral Link earrings. And of course the camera doesn't want to focus. Let's try this. Sometimes it works. There we go. So they are individual links. These aren't necessarily historical replicas. Oh, now I gotta focus the camera again. Maybe. Oh boy. All right, interesting. That usually works. So let's try one more thing here. Bring it out. Ah, I got it. All right. So, sorry, technical difficulties. Vikings, technology, not a good combination. All right. So um, these aren't necessarily um, replicas of a piece like I normally do for these demonstrations. Um, these are inspired by uh, Celtic and ancient Sumerian jewelry designs um, that are found in lots of museums, but they aren't based on one specific piece. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, a lot of Celtic designs have the little spirals and like I'm wearing mine, it's individual links of spirals. So I'm gonna show you guys how I make these because it's a newer design. I've rolled it out in the last, within the last month. I think I set, I uh, posted my first one about three weeks ago. So I wanted to show you guys how it's made since it's uh, a very labor intensive process. So let me adjust my camera here. All right. So we are good there. So now I am going to, I have five pieces already cut of my wire. You can see there. And I'm using brass. I like to use brass. If you've seen any of my other videos, 
Um, we are going to talk about work hardening in this one again. Um, and I like to use brass because it is a harder copper alloy, so it's sturdier when I work with it. And this one's not very straight either. I'm going to have to straighten him out. So I'm going to cut one more because if you notice the earrings that I'm making, I do three links for each earring. So I'm going to need six pieces total. So I need one more. And for each link, it's six and a half inches of wire which is why I can uh, if you've looked on my website and maybe seen this jewelry it's very easy to figure out how much material went into it a little easier than it is with the Viking net because I know exactly how much wire goes into each of the links and I know exactly how many links each piece is made up of so, cut this here. That's one more six and a half inch piece. And I will set my wire back up here. All right. So there we go. I have six pieces of wire. And I will set these right here as a reminder of what we're making. And I'll put these off to the side. Don't need those quite yet. All right. So the first thing I have to do is I have to file down all of the ends. And if you've seen me make some of my other pieces, you know that I don't like for the ends of these to uh, have the the chance of rubbing up against the skin and being itchy or cutting you so I always file the ends on every piece of wire unless I know that that ends gonna be hidden so I'm just gonna file all of these down a little bit I might have got my camera just a little bit too low. There we go. So for those of you who don't know us while I'm filing away at these, um, we are Rigger Crafts. My name is Jackie. I am the jeweler. Um, and... We are based out of Baltimore, Maryland. We do a lot of Celtic and Viking festivals and some Renaissance festivals um, in the Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware area. Um, and because of the coronavirus situation, unfortunately, most of them were canceled this year. Uh, so I decided to move all of my events that I would have been vending at and doing my demonstrations to online events. What I do is I normally demonstrate historical jewelry making techniques out of our tent while we're selling. So that's what I'm doing here is uh, just giving you guys a way, even with the social distancing and everything and having to quarantine to be able to enjoy those demonstrations, maybe get a little bit of knowledge and uh you know get your mind off of everything especially for events like manassas that are such big events and we get a lot of people that travel from out of town to come to it you know it really sucks that those had to be canceled as well so i just like to uh show everybody what i do Unfortunately, today I didn't do as many of the historical jewelry making because I'm having a little trouble. If you can't see, my hand is all tore up and bandaged up and everything. Uh, I got attacked by a uh, vicious five-month-old kitten. <laughs> she uh, 
apparently didn't want to be picked up. So I'm having a little trouble actually making my hand do things that I need it to do. This is going to be the most difficult of all of the demonstrations I'm going to do today as far as things that I need my hand to do. So I'm hoping I can uh, get all the spirals made without messing my hand up too much worse. But I just, I can't do a lot of the fine motor skills that I need to do some of my really intricate wrapping and stuff like that. So I picked some things that were a little bit easier on my hand. But they might take a while, like this one. Because we are now 11 minutes in and I'm still filing wire. <laughs> so um, I do these pieces in... Um, earrings, bracelets, and necklaces. You can see I'm wearing my bracelet here. And um, for the necklaces, it takes me around about 10 hours or so to do one necklace. Usually a little bit longer, but I think if I sat down and like that's all I did, I could probably knock it out in about 10 hours. And you'll see why <laughs> this is such a labor intensive process as we make these earrings. So these earrings are six links. That's all we're making. For the necklaces, it's anywhere between 50 and 65 ish, usually, um, links. So a lot more than with the earrings. And there's a lot more uh, labor involved in that as well because I also need to do jump rings and things like that because I make all of my necklaces. You can see here, it's adjustable. So it's got a bunch of jump rings and the clasp so you can adjust it lengthwise to whatever you like. And we'll look at those when we're done in a little bit more detail. So the next step, now that I have these all filed, Move this out of the way for a second so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to take my ruler and I need to, on each of these wires, I need to mark it. Now I use a Sharpie pen because it's thin and because with the metal, the Sharpie's just going to come right back off. So half of six and a half is three and a quarter. And then I want to go three quarters of an inch out from that. So I'm going to mark it at two and a half and four. And then I need to make those markings go all the way around the wire just to make sure I can see it. And I'm going to do that on every one of these wires. Three and a quarter, two and a half, and four. And these are going to be the marks that tell me where I'm bending the wire in the middle to make my link and how far in I need to bring my spirals when I make my links. Um, so, mark all six of these. And if anybody is in here watching, I think somebody liked the video. So it says there's four people watching. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to ask. I do have a screen right there. So I can see. And I could have pre-marked all of this, 
but I kind of today wanted to give everyone a feel for how long it actually takes to make a piece. Um, I, a lot of times with the, the recreation pieces that I have that I demo at events, um, I have those down to where I can do them in about 15 or 20 minutes normally um, because a lot of people that are at the events want to try and continue and move on, see other vendors and things. So I wanted to do something a little bit different today, especially for the folks that normally go to Manassas because they've seen most of my jewelry making demonstrations. Oh, Jenna. Hi there, I'm gonna try and do this with you. What are the measurements again? Okay, Jenna, um, six and a half inch is what you're cutting. Um, and I have six of those. And then you're going to three, once you've got that cut out and straightened, you're gonna make a mark at three and a quarter, two and a half and four. And you want your Sharpie mark to go all the way around your wire just so you can see it when you're doing your twists and curling them in so we are done with that and i am going to put my ruler away hopefully i don't need that again all right tea it's good for you and it is cold outside so it's cold in this little room that I've got blocked off from the rest of the house now my next step is I have to make my spirals and this is gonna be probably pretty hard to see unfortunately three and a half no Um, let me type it here. Three, two, five, two, five, five. So it's three and a quarter, two and a half, and four, Jenna. And it is on a six and a half inch wire. You had that right. <laughs> I know it's confusing. I have it written down in a notebook. Otherwise, I would never remember. <laughs> All right. So for my spirals, I have these round nose pliers. These are teeny tiny. I have a smaller set. See if I can find them since it looks like there's somebody else in here who does jewelry. Um, I have these and I have these and I will explain to you why I made the choice to use these. So these actually have a smaller tip, the silvery or the gray ones. Um, they have smaller tips, but I've found that when the tips are this small, they're not sturdy enough because I'm using an 18 gauge wire. I like a more robust piece and um, I don't like to use the 20 gauge wire that a lot of people use when they make these. It's easier <laughs> and it hurts your hands a lot less, but I like to use a more robust wire just because it's sturdier. Um, and then obviously I have like your standard big round nose pliers, but these don't have small enough tips to actually make your spirals the size that you want them. So these are the ones that I like. And these are, these are Lindstrom's, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, these are Lindstrom's. So if you're looking for a pair of pliers to do this with, I like these. So to make your spirals, you want to, Hold it as far up on the end as you can in your round nose pliers and make your spiral 
as small as you can start it, but you don't want to close it up all the way. You see how I've got like a little, almost a J made there? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my flat nose pliers and push that in and curl that end in so I've got a very, very small circle. It's not flat, but it's very, very closed um, and very small. And then I'm going to take and grab that with my flat nose pliers again. And you're not going to try and really clamp down on it too hard with your hand. Um, you want to have a good enough grip that it's not going to move, but you also don't want to mar your metal. And that's another big thing you want to watch out for when you're working with um, the, the larger gauge wires is they also mar um, and it's a little harder to fix. So what I'm doing is I'm not using the pliers to twist in. I'm actually using this thumb to push the wire down and back in towards itself to start my spiral. And then I'm going to take my pliers here again. And I'm trying to do this where you guys can see it. I'm going to squeeze that spiral back in on itself to where it's touching the other side like that. There we go. And then I'm going to grab it again. And again, I'm going to push it back in on itself and push that back in on itself and keep going around like that. And I want to keep this as tight as possible. So I'm pushing it all the way back into touching the wire that it's wrapping around. I don't want any space on this. You can see it's starting to form a really tight spiral there. And I'm going to take that all the way. You see my mark there that I made with the Sharpie. I'm going to take that all the way until it overlaps a little bit where the Sharpie mark is. There we go. You can see where my Sharpie mark is and it's overlapping it just a little bit. And then you can take your finger and rub that and it comes right off the Sharpie mark. Now your fingers will be covered in Sharpies by the end of probably the earrings. Um, <laughs> Usually, by the time I've done a full set of this jewelry, um, my hands are still uh, dyed with black Sharpie <laughs> for a few days. Um, so I've got that side done. And the, the spiral is coming up and facing towards the camera. So I'm going to spiral my next spiral in the same direction. Again, I'm grabbing it. Whoops, that happens a lot. <laughs> I'm grabbing it as close to the end as possible and making a really small J shape there. And then I'm going to take my flat nose pliers and close that in on itself. Okay, and using my thumb to push it around and then squeezing that end in just a little bit so it closes up. And now I'm going to do the same thing again that I did on the other side. So I'm starting my spiral there. And I'm going to keep going all the way around until I get to the other mark. Okay. 
keeping it again as tight as I can of a spiral and the trick with this isn't to try and do as much around as you can each time I'm pushing in with my thumb um, do it in tiny little bits um, because if you try and do a big section at a time that's how you're going to end up with a looser spiral so go as close to this as you can and just do a little push every time like that there's another comment all right so now i have that piece and I've got my two spirals going in the same direction and I'm going to set this aside and now I have five more so I'm going to try and do those a little bit faster here again making the smallest little starter loop possible and then squeezing to close it up and then I make my spiral Okay, and then I wipe my Sharpie mark off once I get to it. And do the other side. So today, like I said, I uh, wanted to do something a little bit different than my normal demonstrations that I would do at events because Manassas we've done for... Um, this would have been our third year every year that they've had the festival we've done it and uh, everybody that's been there has pretty much seen my demonstrations so I wanted to do something that's a bit different something you're not used to seeing um, but still a demonstration because you know the people that go to the, the festival, come, and they like to watch the demonstrations and everything. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to be doing a little bit later is Yarek and I are going to be playing uh, Teffel, which is a Viking chess game. Um, it's a historical game. Um, we'll give some more of the history on it during that video. Um, but we're going to be playing it and I will likely be losing. <laughs> um, those of you who know us personally probably already figured that out. Uh, there is one thing Viking Yarek is good at that is uh, that is board games. And it's a strategy based game. But if you guys like that and you would like to uh, see some more of that kind of stuff, let me know because I also have a game that is um, even older than that. It's uh, the oldest board game in the world. Um, it's a 5,000 year old board game from the uh, city of Ur. And I can't remember exactly where that is off the top of my head. I believe it was Sumerian. Um, but we have that. And it's a very fun game. Uh, Yarek and I played it last night and both really enjoyed it. So if that's something you guys would be interested in watching, let me know. Because I would love to do that as a demonstration. It's super fun. So going to keep the spiral going here all the way around 
and a little bit more. There we go. And do this one. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, for whatever reason, I'm having to actually scroll to see all of the comments today. It's not actually popping them up like it normally would. So, got my little bitty spiral there. This thing doesn't want to focus today. There we go. Got it started. We'll keep going here. All right, so that's three. That's enough for one earring. Let's do our next three here. <laughs> and I want to close that in. There we go. All right. Up, oh, somebody's joining us. Up, oh, it's Astrid. Come here, pretty girl. If the camera gets bumped, I apologize. <laughs> My little princess decided she needed to join the, the demonstrations today. So later today, hi baby, you leaving now? All right. <laughs> Um, later today, I'm going to be doing a 14th century medieval hairpin demonstration. And that is always a good one to do. I get to use my cool tools with that. All right. And the thing I wanted to point out with this, if I set this down, here you can see that it's not not sitting flush so gently if you're doing this yourself you want to make sure that those are pretty much level with each other um, if you twist it too much you'll work hard in it and we're going to talk about that here in a second actually we can talk about that now because you won't be able to hear me when I'm hammering when I talk about it um, so copper and uh, copper alloys, which is what brass is, brass is copper and zinc, um, they work hardened. So it's a soft metal, but as you are working with it, the molecular structure of the metal changes. So I like to think of it as when it's a fresh metal straight out of the, um, the kiln or 
however you've chosen to uh, anneal it, which is the process of making the metal soft again, um, which I use um, if I'm doing something with a really large gauge metal and I need to anneal it at any point, I like to use a propane torch. Um, or <laughs> pro tip, if you have a natural gas stove, <laughs> it's hot enough. <laughs> and you don't have to go outside. Um, but uh, the molecules are nice and round, and I think of them as fat, happy molecules. They're just bumping around in each other, and they're not compressed or anything like that. Um, and as you work with it, they start to compress down into, into bricks. So I tell people um, the easiest way to think of it is if you had a tube, and that tube is full of marbles, right? It's, it's a soft tube, and it's full of marbles. You can bend that tube all day, and the marbles are fine, and it's easy to bend. But if you filled that tube with Legos, and started stacking those Legos together, it's going to progressively get harder and harder to bend that tube. So if you've ever taken a piece of copper tubing or anything like that, and you've bent it and then tried to bend it back, and you couldn't get it to bend back straight, that's why you were work hardening it. So the more that you work with the metal, like what I'm doing here where I'm making my spirals, and then I'm going to hammer it, um, the more that you work with it, the harder it gets and the sturdier it gets, which is good, but the harder it is to work with that metal. So when I do things like the hairpins and things like that, I have to hammer the pin part because that's what's either going to go in your hair or... Um, you know, if I'm working on a brooch, that's the pin for the brooch that needs to go in and hold the garment together. Um, so you want that to be hard. With this, you're working this piece so much that you're really only trying to, to work harden a section at a time. So what we're going to be hardening when we go to that step is the uh, spirals themselves. So I'm going to finish off these spirals and then we're going to get to hammering here. And I am using my bench block here instead of my little anvil today because I need a nice flat surface and I don't have anything that's really going to be sticking out underneath it that I have to worry about like when I'm doing the brooches and I've got a piece that I need to hang off the side or something like that. This I can get something nice and centered and I've got my sand block underneath um, so that I can hammer and knock things down off of my mannequins uh, so that I can hammer and not worry about damaging my table or making too much noise. Oh man, Astrid has found strings hanging up on my dress that's hanging on the door. So I might have to uh, get up and get her to stop that. <laughs> Astrid. Oh man, we are 40 minutes in everybody. <laughs> For those of you who are sticking with me, thank you. Um, like I said, I wanted to show you guys exactly how much work goes into making these pieces because they're beautiful and I love them. Um, and I honestly, I do enjoy making them. You guys know I like doing the things like the Viking knit where it's something semi-repetitive and relaxes me. Uh, but I also enjoy hammering these. Um, but 
they are a little on the expensive side just because of the amount of labor that goes into them. If you guys can hear that, that's Astrid playing with a, a string off of my other apron dress, the pink and green one that I normally wear on these streams. I've got it hanging on the back of the door in the studio. <laughs> She's found it. <laughs> uh, the joys of cats. All right. So that was number six. Hooray! We're done with that step. Now, the next step, these are bail making pliers. Um, you can use a larger set of round nose pliers, since I know somebody who's watching is trying to make them too. So if you don't have any of these, you can use some larger round nose pliers. I like these because each step is a consistent size. Um, if you're using round nose pliers, take your Sharpie marker and make a mark where you want to consistently make your bend. Um, that way you know that you are, okay, you've got three, excellent. <laughs> all right so um but like i was saying you want to make a mark if you're using these because you want to know that you're making um your bends the same width every time so i've got these i like to use for this step this one right here it's my third largest size so i'm going to take my pliers here Grab it right in the middle where I made that, that middle mark on the three and a quarter and bend down both of these towards each other. This is very hard to do towards the camera. So you've got it like that. And then you want to, I'm just going to straighten them out a little bit here. They got a little messed up while I was bending. You want to bend them towards each other and see if I can mess one up just so show you how to fix it so you see how i've got that and one is substantially longer than the other what you want to do is the one that's shorter move it out away from the other one and move that one closer to it and then move back in towards the other one and move back towards it so that they end up being pretty much even even height so that you don't have um an asymmetrical spiral there so there's one and you also need to make sure when you're doing it that you're holding your pliers with the side that you want to bend it on um down so that your spirals end up on the outside not the inside um seems like it should be pretty uh, self-explanatory, but sometimes you get in a rhythm and you forget what you're doing and you'll just pick up a piece and start bending it and realize, oh crap, I've got that facing the wrong direction. <laughs> and you wanna make sure when you're bending them, um, sometimes these will be, see if I can bend this here, kind of bowed like that. You want to put your finger in the middle and then grab it with your other two fingers and push down with your thumb and kind of flatten that out so that when it's sitting down, it's flush or as close to flush as you can get it. And make sure that your spirals aren't sitting at a weird angle so that everything lays pretty much flat on your bench block. You want to bend all six of them 
like that. And while I'm doing that, I wanted to um, remind everybody, I am going to have the Viking Knit videos. I'm posting the pre-recorded live videos because I do those. Again, that's what I'm kind of known for at events. Um, so I do those at every single event. And I put them in every single online event. So I wanted you all to uh, have the opportunity to see other stuff. So I'm going to post the lives and you guys can go back and watch those. Or not the lives, the, the pre-recorded ones. Um, so that you guys can enjoy these live videos and see other stuff if you've already seen those. And if not, you get bonus footage. Oh, yeah. See, Jenna, <laughs> learn from my mistakes. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I'm here for. I'm here to make the mistakes. <laughs> if anybody caught, um, what was that? I think it was my last event, the first time I made the um, the same medieval hairpin that I'm going to be making today. I picked the wrong size wire for my pin part. Um, it, it's, and the coil wouldn't fit over it, and so I ended up having to start all over making that part of the, the hairpin, and it was live, so <laughs> there was no covering up the fact that I messed up. So now that we have all of these made, um, the other thing is before we start hammering, you want to make sure that they're all touching right there in between the spirals. You want to make sure that those stay touching. Um, you can adjust it as you're hammering, um, but you want to make sure that, and when you're adjusting to make sure that they're touching, just grab them and push them in towards each other like that so that you make sure they're touching. All right. So the next step, I am using a heavy hammer. This is a 12 ounce hammer. You can do it with a regular chasing hammer. But I like to get the more bang for my buck is how I think of it. Um, so I use a 12 ounce hammer. Um, it doesn't seem like a heavy hammer when I just say it's a 12 ounce hammer, but a pound is 16 ounces. Still doesn't seem like a lot until you realize that when I'm hammering, I've now made all of these. When I make a necklace, 60 links, and I've got a hammer. 60 links and somebody can do the math. I'm sure one of you in there has got a calculator pulled up to do this math right now. Um, there's two spirals on each link and I do each spiral and flip it over. So that's four per link times 60. And then I hit each link. We'll say three times each spiral three times. Uh, so four times 60 times three, that's how many times I actually have to hit things with the hammer. It's a lot. It's, it, it gets a little bit heavy after a while. Um, so you can use a lighter hammer, um, take breaks. And, um, if you're not familiar with good form for hammering with this one, I don't like holding it way back because this isn't a jeweler's hammer. I hold it about mid shaft um, because this handle isn't made properly. Um, that's just me not having the correct tools for the job. But if you have a jeweler's hammer, great. If not, please try not to uh, hammer incorrectly. <laughs> All right, so when you're hammering, let's see if I can get this a little bit closer so everybody can see. All right, so to hammer these, you want to hammer the two spirals, and you can hammer in between the two spirals a little bit, but you do not want to hammer basically that part, that section. You don't want to hammer because you still have to work with that. You don't want to work hard in that metal. So... Watch your fingers, especially if you're using a heavy hammer. This is metal. That's metal. It's going to hurt. And hold it down a little bit. And and 
and you're not really trying to flatten it. You're just trying to harden everything up. And when you're using a hammer this heavy, two to three hits is about all you need on each spiral. If you're using a small little chasing hammer, like this guy, you might need like six hits. Um, just because, and you're going to put more force into that one. With this one, I'm not backing up very high. I'm just... getting real short little hits because I don't need a lot with the extra weight. All right. Okay. And uh, that's why I said it was important to make sure that that laid flat because if it wasn't already laying flat when you started hammer on it, you're just going to malform it even more. So before you start hammering, make sure that your spirals are actually laying flat or as close to it as you can get them. Otherwise, they're going to get even more messed up, and you don't want that. You don't want to try and fix that. <laughs> so, the next step is we get our six links here. And I do everything in, in steps and do it to all the links at once, kind of like an assembly line, um, because it makes it easier to keep up with where I'm at and what I'm doing. Um, and that's just personal preference, I guess. So the next step is I need to bend these over and form them into links. For that, I use my second smallest on my bail making pliers. And you want to go a little bit above your, your uh, spiral there. So I'm going to go right about there on my link. You can see where I'm at there. And then bend backwards till you get it about 90 degrees or so. And then bend it over by hand so that you're getting it to that shape. And then I like to finish it with my finger, um, but you can see here how when I did that, it separated my spirals a little bit, just a tiny bit. So you want to take your fingers and again, push those together so that they squish back together there and they're touching again. And then I take just my index finger and my thumb and I'll push this down and I, I'm pushing with my thumb right in between those two spirals um, because if you push on one spiral or the other, obviously it'll squish that spiral down. Um, so with my thumb there, I'm going to push that down just a little bit. And you don't want to smoosh it all the way down. You just want it to be parallel. I'm going to do that with all of these now. Again, I'm going to bend this to where it's at about a 90 and bend it over a little bit on the pliers. Make sure that my spirals are touching again using my thumb and forefinger. 
bend it so that it's parallel. And I've gotten pretty good at this step <laughs> from doing it so many times. Um, but sometimes it does take a little bit more tweaking. Um, so don't feel bad if it's taking you a little bit longer. It's It comes with uh, doing it so many times, you, you get a feel for what you need to do. As with most jewelry and really any craft that you do with your hands. I'm going to squish those together again. And with my thumb and forefinger, bend those over so that it's parallel. And if it's not perfectly parallel, it doesn't really matter um, for right now. Um, we're going to, you'll see the next step is when we actually put them together. So that's why it doesn't really matter if it's perfectly parallel because you're just making, basically making your links. And if after you've gotten it bent over parallel, they start coming apart again, because sometimes they do when you pinch them, um, again, just tweak them and push them in towards each other. And that will put your spirals up next to each other. Um, and this is my personal way of doing this form of jewelry making. Um, like I said, there, it's not based on an actual artifact, so there's no right or wrong way to do this. You've got some people that have, you see when I do my links here, I don't like to have space, a lot of space in between the links. I like them to kind of basically lay on top of each other um, so that they're right next to each other, so you don't have a lot of extra space. But you'll see some people that like to do them where they're real spaced out and you can see that they're links. Um, which I get doing that because it uses less material and it goes a lot faster to make something the same distance, but this gives you a much fuller look. Um, so personal preference, um, but again, it makes it takes longer. <laughs> so when you have your links made, the next step is you are gonna hold one link and you want, see if I can do this backwards here. So you're holding your link and that part would be facing you is the easiest way to do it. You're gonna take your next link and you've got your loop facing down, right? And this loop is facing to what would be your right. You're gonna take your loop on this one and slide it in through that first loop in the middle there and link them together like so. Once you've got them linked together, you are going to take again your thumb and forefinger and push your spirals down so that they're sitting on that loop underneath it so that this part is closed up. You can see there how it's closed up, but this one is still open because again, this is three links that go in here. So do the same thing again. You have that loop there. This loop is going to go. It's harder to do when it's facing away from you. This loop is going to go inside that other loop. I made it look so easy the first time. There we go. It goes inside the other loop and now they're connected and I'm going to push that loop down like so. And then since these are earrings and they're only three loops long, I'm going to grab this loop and close this last link off. And I'm going to do the same thing with these. So got it with the loop facing to your right grab this link so it's facing you goes in through that hole 
and you're going to use your thumb and forefinger here to close that link on the next one. And then same thing here. Got the back facing you. Bring that through. And your thumb and forefinger to close that next link. And close that last link on it. Now, what I like to do, I think it makes it look nice to finish it this way. Um, I like to take my links and gently fold the links so that the links are, the spirals are folded down on the sides. So you can see there, maybe if I can get this, oh, maybe if I'll lay it on here. You can see that instead of being flat, they're now bowed. And that just helps it, um, helps keep stuff from getting under the loop, the links as easily um, and around your spirals. And if you have one like this one where the, the spirals overlap each other, that's perfectly okay because they're nice and tight there. This this link overlaps this one. Um, what I like to do is make sure that this underneath link is squished down a little bit more so that this, lo this link clearly sits on top of the other link. I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm going to bend those down. Man, there are seven people still here watching this. I am impressed that you guys watched an hour of me fighting wire. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to bend those down like that. And this one's got good spacing, so none of them are overlapping. And now I'm going to take, this is 16 gauge wire, so it's a little bit thicker than what I used for that. And I just need a small little bit here. Oh, I had some scraps sitting over there, too, I could have used. Oh, well. What I'm going to do with this is take, again, my bail making pliers. I use them for everything. They are probably my most versatile tool. Hi, Terry. Thank you for sharing. All right, so I'm going to make some jump rings so that I can attach these little guys to my ear wires. Um, if you're following along, um, I use, again, the fourth now size on my bail making pliers. So it's the biggest of the two middle ones. Um, for these and I'm just going to make some jump rings by winding this wire around that middle section and I really only needed two jump rings but I made sure I gave myself enough wire wrapped around there that I have some extra and I make all my own jump rings. If you have jump rings pre-made, if you buy, if you buy them, great, good on you. Um, you can use those. Um, I apparently prefer to work harder, not smarter. Um, so I'm going to cut these, and I cut them so that the flush side of my flush cutters. So I have to flip my cutters over so that it's flush side and flush side. If you're making your own, that's important to remember. Um, otherwise, you have to file down the not flush side, and it looks a little weird. Okay. Two jump rings. 
and I don't have the correct pliers out, but these will work. If you're working with jump rings, if you've never done chain mail or anything like that before, you don't pull them apart this way. You bend them, you twist them to bend them open. So that you're only bending them in this direction, not this direction. And I'm going to take and put the top of my link in there. And close this up. And that's got a, a funky edge on it. So it's important when you're making your own jump rings. Again, watch your edges. If you've got... I don't know what happened to this edge when I made it, but if you've got a gross edge, especially if you're selling your jewelry, um, just be mindful of that, um, that somebody's going to wear this and it's going to be up against their skin, possibly. So, And then I always kind of clamp down at the end there just to make sure that everything stays flush. So there is one, and wrong side. I'm going to bring these two back together. And that one doesn't need to be filed because I didn't make a gross jump ring. I don't know how I did that first one. All right. So I've got those made. Now I need to get my ear wires separated here. And my ear wires function pretty similarly. Um, these are surgical stainless steel. I always use surgical stainless steel in all of my ear wires. I do jump lock, just like the jump rings where I bend that out to the side. So I've got that bent out to the side there. And I'm going to slip my jump ring. Make sure that the front of your earring is facing the front of your ear wire there. And then can't do this and hold it to where the camera can see. My hands just aren't functioning that way today. I'm going to bend that back around and make sure it's nice and straight so that my earring is attached to my ear wire. Do the same thing with this one. And I did that one backwards. After I just said, make sure the front of your earring is facing the front of your ear wire. I'm a professional, guys. And then make sure it's straight. Ta-da! All right, so I'm going to put these on a card so I don't lose them. And I always put these little rubber backers on all of the earrings because I didn't used to get those, <laughs> but I lost a pair of my earrings. And I was very upset, so I didn't want that to happen to anybody else. So now they all get the little rubber backers as well. So that is another set 
of the earrings. Um, I also do these in bracelets and the bracelets are made pretty much the same way. Um, I think this one is, yeah, it's a seven inch. So it's the same size as the one I'm wearing. So it's 17 lengths, the uh, links, uh, to make a seven inch length, which my wrist is about a six and a half inch wrist. And it fits me perfectly. As you can see, this, this bracelet fits wonderfully. Um, so the way that I do the bracelets is I put a jump ring on the end, just like I did with the earrings. But this end piece here is actually a longer link that has the center section flattened and then turned into a clasp so that you guys don't have to, it's not as noticeable that you have a clasp. You can't really see it. You can just kind of see that jump ring there. And I have available in the bracelets right now. So I have three pairs of the earrings available currently. I have one of those seven inch and an eight inch bracelet. And I can add jump rings to a bracelet if you wanted something that's a little adjustable. And then in the necklaces, and I also have the earrings too. Um, these have gold ear wires, black ear wires. It's a preference thing, whatever you want. If you want to request certain color of ear wires. And then for the necklaces, what I do is I make a clasp that is attached to a jump ring on the end of one of the links there. And I do a section of my jump rings that I make. And that gives you an extra three, I think this has got four inches of jump rings uh, so that it's adjustable to whatever length that you want, which is handy. So I have that one, which is 19 inches and it's got, my, I think I said that's like four inches or so of extra jump rings. Let's measure. Three and a half. Three and a half inches of jump rings. So you're getting between 19 and 22, 22 and a half inches out of this necklace. So you can wear it kind of like a choker like mine or a little bit longer. Hey, there we go. No, I didn't get it high enough. <laughs> the joys of working by yourself. So I like mine a little bit shorter just because um, when I'm wearing my, my garb, my necklines come up really high. So I had a thing with uh, my Viking knit necklaces and stuff that I have. Um, a lot of times the pendants will either come up and when I'm moving around, they'll get lost inside this dress or they'll get lost inside this dress. And then you can't really see it. So I wanted one that's kind of not really choker length, but you know, right here on the clavicle. Um, and then I have, I have a 21 to 25 inch, which is on this guy. And they're all brass. Like I said, I, I like working with the brass a little bit better for projects like this, but if you have a request and you want them in copper, bronze, or sterling silver, I can do that. And then this one is a 21 to 24 inch. So it is really a take your pick on size. And for those of you who have made it this far in the video, uh, you can use the promo code VIKINGMOM20 for 20% off because it would have been the Manassas Viking Festival 
and it's Mother's Day weekend. I'm really not creative when it comes to these codes, guys. <laughs> so Viking Mom 20 for 20% 20 off Manassas Viking Festival and Mother's Day weekend. Creativity. So um, I think my next, let's see here. The next uh, scheduled event here is going to be, I think, 2.30. And we are fast approaching that. I hope it's not 2 o'clock. My phone doesn't like me right now, apparently. There we go. Let's see. Yep, yeah, 2 o'clock. So in about 15 minutes, I could just stay on this <laughs> the same stream, um, but I'm going to get off of here, clean some of this stuff off the desk, and I will be back to do the 14th century hairpins. Show you guys what it's gonna be here. Right here, these are based off of a museum piece in the Museum of London. And they are really cool. They have a coiled coil of wire. See if I can get it to focus on this instead of me. No. Well, they are on the website um, if you want to see some good pictures. Um, all of the Celtic Spiral link stuff is on the website. Um, and I think my first Viking Knit video should have just posted, maybe. Um, I don't remember. I set those up to automatically post. So <laughs> I will see you guys in about 15 minutes. Thank you for joining me. And let me know if you liked this extended hour and 15 minute long demonstration, or if you like the shorter ones better, um, or if you have a request of anything else that you want to see me make. Thank you. Bye.